If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them. And I'd like you to look at Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. We continue our series on biblical hermeneutics or interpreting the Bible. The do's and don'ts of interpreting the Scripture. We saw in the resurrection account how important it was for language and for context and for comparing Scripture with Scripture in order to get a full picture on any specific teaching. This morning I want to talk on the subject collapsing contexts. Collapsing contexts. What happens when you bring two verses together that don't have any relationship to each other except maybe a similarity of wording and then you use that as a means of teaching doctrine. That's called a collapsing context. So I want to give you a good illustration of what happens when that occurs. In Proverbs, the eighth chapter, there is a very interesting series of verses which is quoted by the cults, by Jehovah's Witnesses, by the Mormons, and by any number of mind science cults. Unfortunately, sometimes it's even quoted by uninformed Christian scholars who seem determined to build their theories and doctrines at the expense of the text itself. But in Proverbs chapter 8, Solomon says, Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? She stands in the top of high places by the way in the places of the paths. Unto you, O men, I call, verse 4, and my voice is to the sons of men. O you simple, understand wisdom, you fools, be of understanding heart. Now, keeps on going and discusses this subject. And then finally, it gets down to Proverbs 8, 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there was no depth, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep. When he established the clouds above, when he was strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him, as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, my delights were the sons of men. Now that particular passage is cited by the Jehovah's Witnesses and by others to describe Jesus Christ. And they say, He was set up before all the works of old. He is therefore one of God's works. But He is certainly not God. Typical watchtower argument, typical cultic argument. Then you say to them, Well, wait a minute. That's not in the context. It doesn't say that this is messianic. It doesn't say that it refers to the coming of the Messiah. It doesn't say anything about the Son of God. It just says wisdom. Ah, yes, says the cultist. But if you look further in the scriptures, you will find it. So I want you to keep your finger in Proverbs 8, and I want to show you how to collapse a context. You just squunch it together, and you come out with virtually anything that you want. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is standard operational procedure for the cults and for people that constantly misquote the Bible. 1 we are preaching Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block to the Greeks' foolishness, verse 23. But unto them which have been summoned, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Ah, says the Jehovah's Witness. Ah, says the cultist. There it is. Christ is the wisdom of God. Right? Right. Now go back to Proverbs. Before time began, I was set up. He existed before all other things in creation. By him were all things created. Ah, there it is. Christ is the wisdom of God. Proverbs 8, cross-reference 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is known as collapsing context. It makes sense only because one word appears. Wisdom. 
So if you look at Proverbs chapter 1, Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. You've got to be a nut not to admit it. It's right there in the context. But you go back to Proverbs chapter 8, it begins with these words. Does not wisdom cry out? Yeah, there's something unusual about wisdom. You notice what it is? What is it? It's in a feminine. Please note that. Understanding put forth her voice. She stands in the highest place. She cries at the gates. No way are you going to get wisdom in Proverbs 8 to be Christ in 1 Corinthians 1 because in 1 Corinthians 1, Christ is the incarnation of God and he is a male. And in Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom is described as a female because it is an abstract. Solomon is talking about wisdom in the same way that you would talk about a ship. Isn't she a beautiful craft? That's a female ship? What's a female ship? And you say, well, you know, you don't take that literally. You know, say it's a beautiful boat. You know, because it's a beautiful woman. So she. Oh, okay. So what are you doing when you use the feminine to describe the boat, which is neuter? Huh? You are using an, what? An abstract. And you're just simply saying, well, this is like a beautiful woman. Right? Right. Beautiful ship, beautiful woman, right? Nothing to do with sex at all. Just an abstract. And here you've got Proverbs chapter 8, and Solomon says, Does not wisdom cry? Understanding put forth her voice? What is he doing? He is personifying wisdom and using the term she to describe it. But you collapse the context by doing what? Breaking down everything in between. And you put the two passages together. Does not wisdom cry? I was set up before all other things. And then, 1 Corinthians 1. Christ, the power and wisdom of God. There you are. Proves it. Proves nothing. It proves only that you don't have a clue as to the meaning of terms and personification or discussions of philosophical abstracts. Solomon was a great philosopher. God said, and he wrote Ecclesiastes, which is a philosophy textbook. Solomon clearly points out that wisdom is something that existed with God. As John Henry Cardinal Newman pointed out, a great scholar, God calls his word, Christ, wisdom. Because there never was an instant when the wisdom of God could be separated from the mind of God. Thus, Christ is eternal. Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. Was there ever a time when God was without his power? No. Was there ever a time when God was without his wisdom? No. So, Jesus Christ is the power of God. He is the wisdom of God. Far from the passage in 1 Corinthians 1, agreeing with the idea that he's a creature, it's affirming his divinity from eternity. So when wisdom is spoken of in the abstract here in Proverbs 8, it's describing some of the attributes and characteristics of God under the term wisdom. But it's certainly not saying that it's Jesus Christ. It's certainly not saying it's the Word of God. Instead, it's a philosophical illustration of a spiritual truth. Solomon does it beautifully. So two points. One, can't be Christ because it's feminine. And second, it can't be Christ because you have to collapse the context to get there. And finally, can't be Christ because Christ is called the eternal Word of God. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became 
flesh. So the wisdom of God always existed. And Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. Now, we have another illustration of this collapsing context, which is found in the book Scripture Twisting by a very fine author, Dr. James Sire of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And he likes to point out that when you collapse context, sometimes it really bounces back at you with a vengeance. Mormon Church, for instance, and he cites this, associates Jeremiah 1.5 with John 1, 2, and 14, and implies that both verses talk about the pre-mortal existence of all human beings. Well, let's look at Jeremiah 1.5 and see how it's done. It's another collapsing context, so you have to see how it's done. Mormons say, well, we believe that you existed before you came to earth in a pre-mortal state. And there are passages in the Bible which we think clearly teach this. Jeremiah chapter 1 is one of those passages. So you go to Jeremiah 1 with the Mormon missionary, and he explains it to you. Verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, or in the womb of your mother, I knew you. Before you came forth from the womb, I set you apart, and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Ah, says the Mormon missionary, here's a clear illustration of pre-mortal existence. God is saying, before I formed you in the belly, before you proceeded from the womb into the world, I set you apart. And that proves that Jeremiah existed in a pre-mortal condition. Then they say, now to further illustrate that, turn to John chapter 1, where you have a parallel passage to the same thing, says the Mormon missionary. Now the first illustration was the Jehovah's Witnesses abuse. This is the Mormon abuse. You can see it for yourself. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The same one was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Ah, says the Mormon missionary, what further proof could you ask for? There it is. Jesus Christ is the Word of God, and Jesus Christ existed with God in the beginning. Well, of course he did, because in our sacred revelations, we know that everybody was a spirit child, and that Jesus was the spirit brother of Lucifer, who became the devil. And all of the spirits lived on the great star, Kolob, with the counsel of the gods. So here, when you put Jeremiah chapter 1 together with John chapter 1, you have absolute proof. Jeremiah existed up there, and so did Jesus. Collapsing context. Bring them together, the collapse, it seems to prove what you want to prove. But it doesn't. Why? Because in Jeremiah chapter 1, all the text says in Hebrew and English is, I knew you before you came into existence as a man. Why? Because God calls the things that are not, right? as if they huh, were. How can he do that? Because in his mind, they already exist. God could see you before time began and choose you in Jesus Christ before you were born. How? Because he knew the end from the beginning. Known to the Lord are all his works from what? The creation of the universe. That translates into this. Nothing takes God by surprise. Can't be surprised. Not only is he immutable, can't change, can't be surprised. You never hold a surprise birthday party for God. Absolutely impossible. But you see, by collapsing the context, what you end up with? Pre-existence. Jeremiah pre-existed. Doesn't say that at all. It says, before... I made you in the womb of your mother before you came out into the world. I already had set you apart. 
On the same basis, so did the Apostle Paul pre-exist. Galatians chapter 1. God who called me from my mother's womb, right? Well, that's interesting. He wasn't a person then. Where was he? Well, he was being formed in his mother's womb. He hadn't yet come into existence. Where was he? Mormons say he was on the great stock call up, getting ready to enter the world. You see, the madness of this type of reasoning is that unless you see that they have collapsed two entirely different contexts on you, you don't know how they do it. So you always want to take the first context and put it next to the second context and ask yourself the question, what's it talking about? And nine times out of ten, that blows it out of the water. So go to John 1 and you'll see exactly how the leak develops in the boat. Without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ existed and was creator, isn't that right? But the Mormons deny that. So you say to the Mormon missionary with a pleasant smile on your face, but wait a moment. If these two passages are saying what you say, you have just proven what the Christian church says. Oh, says the Mormon missionary, what's that? Why, you prove that Jesus Christ is God. Oh, well, now, we didn't say that, but the passage does. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, without Him was not anything made that was made, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Who? The only begotten one. Who is that? Jesus Christ. So the Word became flesh, God became flesh, God is Creator, Christ is God. This disintegrates their whole argument because John 1, 1 and 1, 2 in context is teaching the eternal existence of Jesus Christ as God, not as some pre-mortal spirit on the great star Kolob. So you collapse the context and the minute you do, you'll collapse if you're a Mormon. And they're the ones that use this passage. So you want to urge them to show you Jeremiah 1 and John 1. You know, almost beg them to. Because when they get there, Christ is God. And there is no way out of it. You're stuck. Another instance of collapsing context would be Judas went out and hanged himself. Go thou and do likewise. How do you manage that one? Well, you take a narrative, which is Judas hung himself, and then you combine it with a command out of context. You collapse both contexts, and you end up with what? Authorization to kill yourself. You see, in philosophy, we refer to brilliance like this as reductio ad absurdum, which means reducing the dialogue to an absurdity which immediately removes it from any serious consideration. So, when you take Proverbs 8, as the Jehovah's Witnesses do, and collapse the context with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you end up with a totally alien view of wisdom. There's nothing whatever to do with Scripture. When you collapse the context of Jeremiah 1 with John 1, you end up proving the deity of Jesus Christ, which none of the cults admit. And at the same time, you destroy the context of John 1. Jesus isn't just being talking about, talked about as being pre-existent. He's talked about as God pre-existent from all eternity. Nothing whatever to do in relationship to Jeremiah chapter 1. Now, there are quite a number of other instances of collapsing contexts. Next week, we get into it. I'm going to show you how the faith teachers collapse the context of faith healing. And you will see, very simply and succinctly, how it's possible to end up teaching anything if you ignore what the context says and just collapse whatever context you want. I'm going to do that next week. Now, you're probably sitting here saying, okay, you made your point. You proved it. What practical lesson do I get from this apart from how to interpret? Well, if you got no other thing out of it but how to interpret, you'd be way ahead of the game.
But let me give you something practical, fiercely practical and spiritual. The scripture is trying to tell us from Genesis to Revelation that God has a message. The scripture itself is the message, and it also contains messages from God. There's a message in all of this, which is do not handle the word of God deceitfully. The message in this is if you're really a servant of God, Second Timothy should be your byword. Study. Show thyself approved by God. And this, is special, this is the spiritual message for you. Approved by God. You see, God says if you study his word and if you submit your mind to his, that you become profitable by being able to handle the Word of God properly. Study and show thyself approved by God. A workman who doesn't need to blush with embarrassment. That means opening your mouth to exchange your feet. Rightly, the King James Bible says, dividing the Word of Truth. That's not what the Greek says. The Greek says, rightly interpreting the word of truth. The greatest thing we can aspire to as witnesses for Christ is not only fidelity in the preaching and defense of the gospel, but in accuracy in the handling of God's word so that we do not become deceitful in its usage and application. And we take very seriously that one day when we stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus, we will give a personal account to him of how we handle Scripture. Your blessing is learning how to handle it so that when you appear in his presence, you will not be ashamed. You will have rightly interpreted the word of truth, and you will have avoided twisting men away from the gospel. As Peter puts it very succinctly, in his epistle. They rest the scriptures or twist the scriptures to their own destruction. By learning how to interpret, you will not be guilty of this. And you will become the means of other people's salvation and edification. That's how important it is to rightly interpret the word of truth. Our Father, we thank thee this morning. And we have seen in thy word how we may understand what thou hast said very clearly by paying attention to some of the simple things of interpretation that you have made known to us. We ask you now through your Holy Spirit to teach us this lesson this morning, to fill us with the power and presence of Christ, and to help us rejoice in thy great salvation. We thank thee that the Lord Jesus Christ died on Calvary to save us from our sins, that he rose immortal from the grave, and he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He has also told us to obey him, to hold forth faithfully the word of life, and to speak as those anointed with the Spirit and power of God. Bless thy word to our hearts this morning. If there's any person here that does not know the Lord Jesus, give them neither rest nor peace until they shall make their peace with you. In Jesus' name. Amen.